Okay, so now we have um, Chris uh, talking about uh, R or Excel or semi Marco modeling. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Pedro. So uh, my name is Christopher Fawcett, and I'm a research scientist with Clifton Insight. Um, so it's really nice to be here on behalf of my co-authors and colleagues, David Asituno um, and Howard. Uh, thanks to the organizers also, Howard, um, for having us here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the use of R and Excel for complex semi-Markov models with a specific focus uh, on treatment sequencing in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, just as, as, as a little bit of context, when I came to this project, I had about 10 years experience working with Excel uh, and about one to two years working with R and I hadn't yet quite built an economic model in, more, in R. So kind of came to it as a, as a novice in R and probably just a little bit more in Excel um, at the outset. So um, the talk is more so just about our experience in using these, the, in, in using R and Excel for, for building semi-Markov models. Uh, it's not too data-driven, uh, not too code-oriented, um, uh, so it's more just about our experience and we don't have any results to present just just yet uh, still kind of a work in progress uh, but all of that before coming as we plan to to publish and uh, make the code available on github as well okay as a little bit of background um, i suppose in oncology settings uh, economic models have generally relied on the use of partition survival models and cohort discrete time markup models to evaluate the cost effectiveness in new drugs, um, typically using that standard oncology model, a tree state oncology model reflecting stable disease, progressed disease, uh, and death. But with the advent of new lines of therapy and these treatment sequencing options that are, are, are now available for patients that essentially progress on treatment, more complicated models such as semi-Markov models are needed to, 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 to simulate that varying hazard of progression such that when patients progress the further progression resets or the probability of further progression resets. So more complicated models are needed than typical standard uh, Markov or um, partition survival models. So uh, the overarching aim of this work was to uh, establish the cost effectiveness of uh, treatment sequences in hepatocellular carcinoma in the UK, um, focused on a, a sequence of serafinib followed by regorafinib. And we compared that then against uh, single line therapies, including atezabeb um, and lenvatinib. And the reason why we compare double against single line therapies is that regorafinib is, is only licensed for patients that progress on uh, serafinib. Um, so for the other single line therapies, there is no licensed second line therapy available. So that's why we compared uh, these treatments. Um, and then second to that was to use or an Excel um, uh, to essentially validate each other, but also to compare the, the complexity in, in implementation, uh, look at potential transparency issues, um, uh, look at the efficiency of both approaches, uh, and ultimately compare findings, because one's a continuous time model and the other, of course, is, a, is an approximation of a continuous time model using discrete health states. Okay, so we adapted the, uh, the, the standard three-state oncology model to, to a five-state model, um, that reflected progression-free, progressed disease following first-line treatment, then further progression uh, on second-line second line treatment uh, and death. Um, and our approach was very much aligned with this paper that was recently published by uh, Wang and colleagues um, who put forward a, a conceptual frame, framework for modeling uh, treatment sequences in oncology. Um, to inform our survival outcomes, we conducted network meta-analysis using fractional polynomials on first-line uh, or in the first line setting, uh, we'd in individual patient data from a phase three trial uh, to inform sec survival outcomes in the second line setting. Uh, and we assume the UK perspective, so all costs um, related to the NHS, PSS perspective. Uh, and we essentially assumed a lifetime time horizon, which was 20 years in this case. Uh, so the model structure looks a little bit like this. So patients began in the progression free health state, uh, and then progress depending on their initial line of therapy. So uh, if they started on serafinib, they progress to regorafinib in best supportive care. And they started the other lines of therapy to progress to best, best supportive care. Uh, and then they were at risk of further progression once in that second line setting. Uh, treatment could be discontinued at any point in, in the first and second line setting, uh, and patients could experience um, 
treatment related adverse events and of course die at any stage. So in R, then we use the, the, the HESUM package to control, construct a probabilistic uh, uh, individual level continuous time uh, semi-Markov model, uh, which has the advantage that it's coded or programmed in C++ core, which as we heard yesterday is highly efficient, uh, is object oriented. And it's particularly useful in this context because we're combining probabilistic sensitivity analysis uh, with individual level simulations. Um, and for anyone that's not familiar with it, it's available for a wide range of models and helpfully it has a vignette available online um, and for me coming to this this was really helpful because it, it essentially provided a jumping off point uh, a template by which we could adapt our, uh, our our model and it's very straightforward um users just define the uh, the, the state transition model then go about parameterizing inputs related to disease progression treatment effects costs and utilities and so on and then simulate, pull all that together, simulate outcomes, uh, perform cost effectiveness analysis. And this can be done within HESM using the CE object, or uh, of course, you could create an object and pass it to, uh, or pass it for use within the BCA uh, package uh, as an alternative. Uh, so to parameterize the input in R, um, we conducted our, our fraction polynomials NMA um, using the R total bugs package. Uh, then sample co coefficients were passed to HESIM, and we used these directly uh, to inform first line uh, treatment outcomes. Um, in the second line setting, we had individual patient data, and we estimated survival outcomes using FlexServe and passed that directly to, to, to HESIM also um, for a range of different parametric survival models. Uh, and because our data was coming from different sources, we were able to use the, the param serve object within ESIM, uh, which is essentially a list um, of the various transitions and associated uh, parametric survival models that we wanted to, to, to use in our model. Uh, and then lastly, we, we parameterized our costs and utilities using the state file table, which essentially simulates costs and utilities according to treatment strategy, uh, health state, uh, patient, and of course, uh, time intervals uh, as an option. Uh, the other thing we did uh, was we programmed our codes using R6 classes, um, which basically involved creating a, a, a set of uh, uh, predefined elements or public elements, which we initialized separately in another script. And then we generated uh, uh, our various functions related to our input parameters and functions then were related to building our ESIM models and then combining them and then generating our output. And it really just allowed us to simplify, simplify our, our main script such that we just, just um, engaged our libraries, uh, set our directories, and then loaded all of our different functions um, for the R6 classes, the, the input parameters, and so on. Uh, loaded our survival data, including the fractional polynomials, set our seed just to ensure it was reproducible. Um, and then went about setting up our models, so initializing the number of patients and samples, uh, the baseline characteristics, and then generated our input parameters and fed these then to our, uh, our, our HESA models, or our disease and our cost utility models. And we pulled this all together then in our generate outputs function, um, and we were able then to simulate some, some, some outputs or generate some outputs. Uh, so look at state, state occupancy information, qualities, life years, and costs. And we did all of this within uh, or using BCA package uh, and generate our, our, our cost effectiveness planes and CX and so on and our results matrix. Uh, the other thing we're looking at now at the moment is the use of R. So we're hoping this will, this will accompany the repository when it's published. Um, and it really just works in the same way as the main script, just with the addition that we're able to uh, kind of play around with what the user interface will actually look like in the end. Um, so we've got the left panel and what goes in there, uh, the number of samples and patients, uh, simulations and, and an option to reset to default settings, uh, exploring options with the main tab such that eventually it'll look uh, a little something like this. But again, this is this is a work in progress. Um, so in Excel, then we had to do things a little bit differently. Um, so we had to build tunnel states because we're approximating time in state. So it's not a, quite a, a continuous time uh, model. Um, and to do this, then we had to construct 240 by 240 uh, tunnel states for each of our comparators to reflect the 20-year time horizon. 
uh, and the, the monthly cycle length. Um, and it's depicted here just using these tunnel state maps. So, so following disease progression, patients can, can transition to progress disease where the probability of further progression essentially resets and that probability then changes, of course, over time. Uh, for the rest of it, then we just imported our mean of variance covariance matrices just to inform our survival outcomes, uh, include the costs, utilities, and so on. And we tried to optimize the VBA as much as possible because it was quite computationally heavy uh, and intensive. Um, so we, we, we just thought this, this was quite important because although this, this routing map looks straightforward, in Excel, tunnel states could quickly just become cumbersome, uh, unwieldy, and opaque. So, so it took quite a while to construct the, the, the model in Excel, a little bit longer than it took to do it in R. And this was despite the learning curve with using HESM uh, R6 classes uh, and also the, the R shiny interface. But I should say there was two of us essentially working on the R models, so that probably saved a bit of time. But even with the experience that I brought to Excel, it still took that long to, to build a model. Uh, we did encounter some problems. The, the main one with the R was the problem related to memory. So um, the issue is that with treatment costs and disutilities, we needed to adjust, uh, adjust based on the time as patients spent on treatment. And to do that, we needed information on state occupancy. So we needed to run HESM in the first instance uh, to get that information. So we did that with dummy costs and utility data. And then we updated our cost and utility models with the state occupancy information to adjust for treatment discontinuation. So we ended up with just massive cost and utility tables that are taking up so much space. And there's also the space issue related to running a thousand samples and ideally at some point a thousand patients. So, so far we've got it running with a thousand samples and a hundred patients. So we're still exploring solutions to this. Um, in Excel, then there's the obvious uh, transparency issue. Um, and it, it kind of the, the problem there was trying to identify issues where there, where there were bugs, where were they in the model? Because as you saw, the tunnel states were quite, quite large and we different tunnel states for different treatments. So trying to identify, ident identify problems and of course the location of it was quite difficult and time consuming with Excel. And as we know, like R facilitates greater transparency than Excel with each aspect of the model just by default, because we can provide our, our, our commentary alongside our code that allow users to come along and understand what, what the model is doing. But of course in Excel, uh, formula embedded within, within cells and it becomes hard to, to, to find out what's going on and where source data are coming from. I know I'm being a little bit unfair towards the Excel in this screenshot, but it's really just to highlight that, you know, you have various different sources feeding into different cells at different points in time, and that's feeding off. So uh, just from a transparency side of things, it's very hard to jump into an Excel model and, and understand what's going on. In terms of the efficiency, the R model is running, um, it takes about five minutes to simulate a thousand patients or a thousand samples and a hundred patients. Excel model for thousand simulations is taking about seven and a half minutes. So it's a little bit longer, but when we resolve that memory issue, we might be in and around the same time. Uh, what we found is there's a slight difference in our mean costs and follies between the Excel and the R model. Um, and the possible reason for this is one is a continuous time model based on individuals, and the other is, of course, an approximation of the continuous time model based on a cohort. So that could be accounting for the difference there. But we're still exploring whether or not there's anything else going on with it. Uh, so as next steps with R, we plan on looking at solutions to uh, the memory issue, uh, finalize the R shiny app, uh, validate the code, and finally publish on, on, on GitHub. Um, and then with Excel, again, validate the model. There's one final optimization that we're exploring. That's just the use of a single engine to cut down the size of the model. Um, and then one single set of sub-models as well, rather than having sub-models for each comparator, which will just hopefully increase the efficiency of the model. And we look at potential other reasons for uh, why there's a, a discrepancy between uh, mean costing qualities between the two, but it could just be a, a difference in structural approaches. So just to summarize, uh, I guess, um, semi-Markov models provide a, a very helpful solution to uh, 
uh, this, this issue regarding sequences of treatments, particularly in oncology settings, both OR using HESAM and Excel to be used to construct these models. We found OR a little bit more efficient, definitely more transparent. Um, yeah. And those were more pronounced in the Excel model, more difficult to find. Um, and the labor involved in constructing it was, was, was greater than the time uh, and effort put in uh, or, or the learning curve associated with the, the R model. Uh, and I guess one final point just to finish on is just that uh, it's very rare that you get to see two different softwares being used to, to uh, implement the same model. So in this way, it just has that added advantage that we get to evaluate or, or get to validate uh, the model and findings, which is something we don't often see. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, any questions from the room, Chris? Oh. Oh. Um, so first of all, thank you. That's a really nice example of uh, kind of comparing Excel and, and R and the benefits of working in R. Um, I guess my question relates to storing or the, the issue with storing a large amount of data in memory is mm -hmm. there a reason i might have missed it why you need to store each um each sample or can you not just run them sequentially and then remove the data and just store what you need yeah. mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure that could be an option uh so the reason why it's, it's, it's getting so big is because um we're using the state occupancy information and combining with the cost and the utility data tables um, and then rerunning it, HESIM with, with that. So it's it's it, it's getting larger than when we increase the number of patients, but perhaps there is a way to, to store that information as you're suggesting. Yeah, so we could run it in batches then. Yeah, which is something I think that we're gonna explore as the next step. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I can definitely raise it. I, you're actually hitting on it starts to get very overlapping with simulation studies because you're talking like patient level models and modeling out patient lifetime. So having done a simulation study around utilities, having to model out a whole patient lifetime, I might have been calculating cost effectiveness, but yeah, I think that's where you're hitting the issues. And it's it's where you get some I can send you my scripts because it's all open source as well. It's not just available online, so the same thing. Um, but yeah, I think that's the part of the problem is that you're storing, if you're trying to store it and run it lots of times, yeah, you'll, you'll find that if you're trying to do a thousand runs, it'll be problematic. For a thousand patients, it's generally undramatic. It's just that if you're trying to do it repeatedly, you end up with some objects that can kind of grow. And also, what I found in doing the same thing, if you're using functions, yeah. which you probably are, a dirty little secret I found is you, sometimes if you call a function, send some things, do some calculations in your function, if you don't then remove the variable, it just sort of sits there somewhere that starts to take up more and more space without it telling you of that. The environment just gets smaller that's got left. So I think that's the other thing to be careful with this. That's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. This one's actually online. Loads of questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Can I read it? Is this it here? The last one. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the values and the estimate, how far were the results? Uh, it, it, it was quite small, the, the discrepancy between the two, because we're talking about a, uh, a, a, about a, a disease area where survival outcomes aren't, uh, aren't very uh, good. So, the difference is very, very small in that regard. Um, and I, I can't say a whole lot more about it, but we are we are digging into it a little bit. Uh, I hope I've understood the question correctly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.